Right, okay. <laughs> welcome everyone um, and welcome to those joining us online. I'm Judy Green, chairing this afternoon's seminar. We're very pleased to be here finding a bit, out a bit more about the Waiting Times project. Um, can I just let everyone know that the meeting is being recorded? So if you don't want your question to be recorded as well, um, I'd mime it or I don't know. Or That's take it. Yeah, don't know. <laughs> Email it later. Um, can, uh, Charlotte, can we can we click the got it on the recorded on the screen just so we haven't got that? I don't know whether you can do that from here. Or maybe you, can you do it. You do it Sorry, it's your um, it'll be on your it's computer, right. Judy. So the mouse is just Sorry, in front of you. Sorry. Laura's done it. Thanks very much. So um, we're, we're going to have two presentations, then we will break for five minutes, um, where uh, uh, can I ask people kind of not, you know, maybe they could leave the room or not to have discussion because that bit won't be transcribed. Um, and then we'll come back to the third speaker and hopefully have some time for discussion and questions. So I think without further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to as a Laura Salisbury, our first speaker. Thanks, Judy. Um, and thanks, everyone, so much for coming to our talk today. Just um, can, can you see me, those online? You can. If, if I look that way, am I looking at the people or are you... The a, camera should... The camera's around. Yeah. OK. Oh, OK. So, yeah, the camera's yeah, over there. The I just want to have a sense around. of where the audience is. So thanks so much for coming to our talk today. And we're going to be sharing with you some of the research and findings from Waiting Times, which is a five-year project uh, funded by a collaborative award from the Wellcome Trust. So Lisa Baretza and I started working on this project in 2015 using a seed award from Wellcome and from Birkbeck, and we applied for our collaborative award um, in 2016. And in most of the things that I've got to say today, I think it's important to imagine Lisa here too, and the other team members, as many of the ideas and indeed some of the words that I'll be using are really theirs alongside my own. So in multiple ways, the Waiting Times project seemed timely, shall we say, both in terms of ongoing um, headlines discussing NHS waiting lists and waiting times, but also personally for me. Um, in 2016, uh, my father was admitted to hospital. I rushed to be with him, but by the time I got there, he was in a state of acute delirium. Every 10 minutes or so, he grabbed my hand and said, come on, let's go. And then, what are we waiting for? I explained that he was very ill and that the doctors needed to find out what was wrong. But in terms of what exactly we were waiting for, there were no easy answers. The time to pass, the things to unfold, and I found myself saying, you need to be patient. Patient, he would reply. I think my father could see well enough that he was being treated as some sort of patient, but he was clearly struggling to understand how the endurance being asked for him at that moment represented care or being looked after. The irony of this discussion was not lost on me given the intense work that Lisa and I had been putting into thinking about how the time of care and how the role and meaning of waiting in healthcare relates to experiences of time in contemporary life. With my father's hospitalization, applications for social care, and in the final phase of his life, I got to see up close how waiting can certainly be a screen for service inefficiency, insufficiency, and sometimes even neglect. But I also saw a rather harder to conceptualize aspect of waiting, the endurance and sustained practices of care given when a situation unfolds or it doesn't in the face of a future that's radically uncertain. And I came to see how urgently we need to do, and still need new vocabularies and concepts that might help patients, clinicians, families and carers understand, situate and communicate the meaning of their waiting. So it was this complex but pretty everyday problem that formed the core of our project. If the question of waiting in healthcare seemed crucial and urgent in 2016, perhaps it's even more urgent now following the pandemic, the intensifying effects of austerity policies in the UK and underfunding in relation to increasing health and social care needs. And I want to start with some necessary caveats in relation to waiting in care that in a way we always have to go through when we're talking about this project. No one should be asked to wait in situations that are medically dangerous, in intolerable but relievable pain, or when a quick intervention will improve clinical outcomes. 
being made to wait can be neglectful of legitimate patient needs. But although waiting is often used to mark the success or failure of care in the NHS, waiting is not simply care's opposite. Instead, as all healthcare practitioners know, waiting is intrinsic to care. It's there in the extended time needed for therapy or therapeutics to work, in the watchful waiting before or after diagnosis, and in the time that stretches through remission, relapse or palliative care. Even within the most urgent medical interventions, when waiting is crucial, cardiopulmonary resuscitation during cardiac arrest relies on a tiny hiatus between chest compressions, mimicking the interval of the heartbeats, a wait that can feel like a lifetime. At the other end of the spectrum, many patients in general practice have complex chronic conditions that are often resistant to straightforward interventions, but instead require long-term treatment, monitoring and management. Here, instead of waiting for, it is clinicians' capacity to wait with or simply to continue to be available to their patients. That's often the primary treatment on offer. Our research has shown that paying attention to how the untimeliness of waiting is intrinsic to care rather than dead time enables a deeper understanding of what timely care might be, not just for patients, but also for the NHS and the social mission of the UK's post-war welfare state. Because when waiting is a complex psychosocial experience that becomes meaningful in relation to diverse contexts, We've used a range of methods to attend to our um, different research objects and sites. Forging links between psychosocial studies and medical humanities, we work to bring together historically and culturally contextualized accounts of waiting with research on how psychical, social and political organizations of time structure into subjective life. So we shaped our project across a number of strands that would enable us to pay, um, to think carefully about the experience of waiting time, especially as it plays out in a UK context. The first is waiting in late times, and this is a literary and historical strand investigating, um, first of all, cultural histories of waiting in late modernity and post-war Britain, Form and fugitive care in contemporary US and UK literature and culture, and waiting and care in post war general practice. So, my work is it is that photograph when it was first taken, I thought it was hideous, but as I've aged, I've got to like it better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, well, you see, it's all about waiting. <laughs> um, Yes. So my work has centred uh, on the idea that making sense of what it means to wait now in the UK requires understanding um, how waiting became a structure of feeling in the post-war environment, to use Raymond Williams's term, and how that structure continues to shape the hopes and disappointments of the present. Experiences of waiting can be elusive to track, appearing in the seams of official accounts of the welfare state and those broader arcs of history that might prioritise events and action. So I've looked to objects in cultural history and particularly uh, literary texts to capture experiences where nothing much seems to be happening, but a structure of feeling is created, suspended between intensely different senses of waiting. So these different senses of waiting are, first of all, the care and violence that appears as people wait in relation to the idea of a destructive future that threatens to bring an end to historical time as it's usually accounted for. So whether through nuclear annihilation, say climate collapse or pandemics. Secondly, I'm interested in experiences of waiting and enduring through a suspension, um, through a sense of suspension and even decline. And I'm tracking here what Paul Gilroy has called the post-colonial melancholia of Britain's loss of its sense of being a driving force in global history. So this includes uh, the UK's struggle to admit and mourn the historical and ingoing on ongoing injustices of empire and racialized violence and the experiences of those who carry the legacies of having been forced to inhabit what Dupesh Chakrabarti has called the waiting room or the not yet of global history. Finally, I'm thinking through the post-war collectivized sense of waiting, which is bound into the welfare state. And of course, the creation of the NHS in which everyone becomes a patient, even if only in waiting. This waiting with one another in the name of a broader collective good sits alongside the uneven realities of what I'm calling the long meanwhile of the post-war settlement. 
This is a long meanwhile in which people continue to wait, sometimes with a sense of hope for the promise of a truly universal access to collective social goods to be fulfilled, even as services stagger on in chronic and acute crisis under the threat of imminent collapse or just the gradual withdrawal of what is, it needs to flourish. So uh, Kalechi Anucha uh, did her literary PhD research here at Exeter and in the centre, and she has developed the concept of fugitive care, emerging in dialogue with Afro-pessimist work from Fred Moten and Sadie Hartman and others. Fugitive care describes the ways in which care is inventive, improvised and endlessly challenging, taking place in excess of sanctioned clinical and social pathways. So fugitive care describes the strategies, kinship claims and allegiances that emerge for resisting and negotiating structures of and pathways through medical institutions. So although fugitivity is drawn from US sources, Kalechi's work offers significant insights into how racialized violence and the unfulfilled promises of universal care mark the beginnings and maybe ends of the British welfare state and how care is produced despite everything out of experiences of waiting. These ever shifting offers and, and practices of fugitive care in what we've called the seams of the NHS enable mainstream healthcare services for better and for worse, both to uh, continue to function and to fail to care. As Kalechi analyzes accounts of delayed or deferred milestones in the life course, the sense of stuckness or the continuity of historical violence, interruptions, breaks, council futures, secularity, even invocations of the spiritual in relation to past, presents and futures. Her work reveals how these experiences are expressed, occluded and challenged by different literary forms. And her project also really importantly suggests that critical medical humanities as a field needs to expand its archive by engaging with, engaging with racialized experiences of health and disability, which are not captured in the archetypal illness narrative form. So Martin uh, Moore, who we'll be talking later, his project, Hurry Up and Wait, investigates how general practice was reformulated and modernized through its integration into the early post-war welfare state and how new temporalities of care that emerged and conflicted uh, in response. I'm going to let him introduce his work later on in the presentation and go straight through to the second strand of the project, which is uh, watchful waiting. So in dialogue with Martin's historical research. In our second strand, Stephanie Davis has been working on waiting, staying and enduring in contemporary general practice. Her project investigates forms of care that are precariously maintained in situations in which nothing appears to improve or get better. So Steph's ethnographic research found four sites of NHS general practice where waiting can be a form of care. So care for what's in danger of being neglected or left behind in a crisis, care for chronic states in an outcome orientated healthcare setting, care in relation to inevitable physical decline and degeneration, and care for the NHS after having lost faith in its promise of a better future. So for Steph, clinical activity that appears the least productive in terms of outcomes can be the most responsive when caring in these conditions. The NHS relies, relies on voluntary waiting, staying and enduring to counteract its potential to do harm, especially during times of crisis. Given the rise in long-term health conditions that disrupt clinical ideas around the acute and the chronic, the communi communicable and non-communicable, combined with a steady withdrawal of state funding for long-term support, there is a case for arguing that these are the modes of care most needed in the present, rather than those associated with making the healthcare system more sustainable in the future. So our third strand is called the psychic life of time, and this has involved thinking about waiting and the elongated temporalities of care through the suggestive rhythms of psychoanalysis. So psychoanalysis operates both as a theory of time and as a clinical practice that entails elongated waiting with in order for the transference, which is the repetition of earlier relational patterns, to come to light and be understood so that new ways of relating can emerge. The context in which we've been tracking this form of therapeutic care includes child and adolescent uh, mental health services in the NHS, GIDS, which is the service for gender questioning and trans young people at the Tavistock, and some of the psychoanalytic social clinics around the world. 
and through the development of a number of key theoretical concepts in psychoanalytic and psychosocial theory that have helped us frame, uh, to help, sorry, helped us think about different ways of living on and caring on, as Lisa frames it, outside of the swing of crisis and anti-crisis that structures so much thinking about what must be done in our current times. So Jordan Osserman's project is a psychosocial investigation of temporality and waiting in the care of young people exploring gender identity. And it's involved in embedded ethnography at JIDS during the pandemic, which was, as you can imagine, not easy to achieve at all. Uh, so JIDS is a service with a ballooning waiting list, and it now faces closure before the opening of a new set of national services for gender questioning and trans young people. Waiting for care in this context is extremely difficult, according to both service users and staff, suggesting that the kinds of waiting with that might ameliorate the difficulties of waiting are themselves time sensitive and often untimely. These untimely interventions may be experienced as arriving too late for the young person concerned. Even when someone is moved off the waiting list and into assessment and care, there is often an experience of being held up by a service that offers, wants to offer supposedly thinking time when actually what is needed is treatment. For some young people and their parents and carers, however, the care offered may be experienced as arriving too soon, with delaying the onset of puberty with hormone blockers creating its own experience of untimeliness and new ways of understanding and experiencing development and sequence. In many ways, JID staff have faced an impossible task, how to make the untimely care they offer visible as care, especially in the context of a service in different forms of chronic and acute crisis, in which any form of actual care is troubled by the length of the waiting list, political opposition, and JID's representation in the media as a profoundly uncaring service. Jordan's project tracks untimely care, bringing his ethnographic observations into dialogue with psychoanalytic accounts of gender and temporality. Despite its own struggles to understand transgender experience in non-pathologizing ways, he argues that psychoanalysis holds some promise because it's uniquely attuned to the ethical imperative to go on staying with a situation whose solution is not readily forthcoming. Jordan also argues that the untimeliness JIDS is blamed for is perhaps not solely the result of NHS waiting times or service mismanagement. It may also be a manifestation of something untimely at the heart of gender itself, which is complex and emergent over time and cuts across rigid boundaries. This essential untimeliness activates cultural anxieties that are then projected onto the figure of the trans or gender questioning child. Between a young person and a service in crisis, care may entail all parties bearing what, that what is going on, sorry, that what is on offer is going at some level to miss its mark. Jocelyn Catty uh, works among, uh, as a principal child and adolescent psychotherapist in the NHS in a busy child and adolescent mental health service, where the waiting list currently runs approximately a thousand young people. Joss theorizes adolescence as itself a crisis of time, examining the adolescent mental health crisis for what it tells us about the power of urgency and the uses of time in critical situations. Urgency and temporal pressure emerge as the shadow side to waiting and suspended time, just as NHS waiting lists hover in the background of the waiting times of our project title. Yet she argues that it's only by giving and making time, by being prepared to wait with and for young people, that it's possible to open up a sense of the future where it may be experienced as radically foreclosed, both individually and more socially. Hold on. Now, Reluca Soriano uh, has been developing theoretical findings from her engagement with the work of the Hungarian psychoanalyst Sandor Ferenczi and his sense of the violent internal plurality of times caused by trauma, which have to be disentangled by the patient and analyst as they wait together. Reluca's second contribution to the project has been her thinking about the place of containing anxiety in relation to waiting and what she calls collective containers, containing being this image and ritual of holding that goes on in mental health work. A pilot study at the Tavistock on the role of the psychoanalytic group's supervision in, quote, as Rulonka puts it, containing the container, 
helped us to understand the layered temporalities involved in such holding, in which the displacement of the now of any therapeutic work to the later of supervision is a necessary part of, of managing the anxieties of waiting. And thirdly, uh, two conferences uh, at the Freud Museum emerged from her waiting times research and have led Reluca on to a major new project on the history and current state of free psychoanalytic clinics around the world. She's developed the concept of psychic convertibility to describe the ways in which these free clinics put money, time and suffering into new sets of relations. This also relates to her notion of friction, which refers to a form of relating to state agendas and resources in which a semi-autonomous collective of practitioners show a kind of up againstness in relation to the demands of the state that can be a creative force for change. So this is a really fascinating new project, this free side project that's going on at Essex right now. So uh, I need to go back before I go forward. Um, Lisa's project in this uh, strand, Watchfully, Watching Waitfully, was developed like all of our work during the pandemic, a time when care and its failures surfaced so profoundly and when some of us were watching a lot of TV. <laughs> so what does failed care tell us about care and its temporalities? Where does failed care become an act of violence? If care makes time by enabling, going on, enduring and maintaining relations, even when what is cared for or cared about may have already receded, then what does failed or violent care tell us about the temporal forms we've been tracking, waiting, staying, persisting, enduring, delaying, returning, repeating and enduring? Are there ways of caring that emerge when we reorganise care as an elongated temporal practice that's never free from multiple dangers of faltering in time? So finally is uh, speaking of waiting, uh, and here Michael is here, has used engaged research methods to tell collective stories of waiting across the NHS. His public engagement is both an object of study as well as a method of his methodology. His field work increasingly became not just publicly engaged, but a critical analysis of what it means ethically, practically, politically, to do publicly engaged research in a moment of shared crisis. I'll let him tell you more about this. So finally, uh, oh, that's you, Michael. That's your nice photo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting further and further away from that time, that's for sure. Um, uh, finally, we uh, cutting across the four strands, we've worked with two artist researchers. The first is uh, Martin O'Brien, who produced an installation, an elongated four hour daily performance over nine days at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London in 2022. And he replies to elements of this show at the Horse Hospital in April 2023 for our conference. Martin lives with cystic fibrosis and has already surpassed his own life expectancy, now living on in what he calls zombie time. Martin works with pain-based practices to think through chronic illness, the body, desire and collectivity. And his concept of zombie time has been central to the project's work, helping us to think about practices of collectively living on and caring on in what often feel like the end times. And Deborah Robinson uses film and neurodivergent experiences of time and attention in ways that disrupt narrative sequence. She made a 14 minute film, Time Being, in collaboration with Rory Kaur, who's a creative maker living with complex, a complex set of visual and sensory processing difficulty, sorry, differences related to the condition of adena leukodystrophy. As Rory and uh, Deborah developed a collaborative relationship over time, they used practices research methods that attended to Rory's everyday experience to develop forms of audiovisual representation that reframe normative versions of time. They worked together to find ways to hold in film the time made when the world is sensed through the hands, the lungs, stomach, the skin, and through the temporal displacements of alternative experiences of sight and sound. Through a practice of waiting, slowing and attending to these sensations, the work gradually emerged. This was not a form of coming to know about the world, but of making sense of it otherwise, over and through time. So 
The question of what it means to wait and the tense relationship between waiting and care, of course, remains timely. As we know, NHS workers are taking strike action to demand pay rises to ameliorate the chronic understaffing threatening the conditions required for caring contact to be made in, in situations of need. If time is represented as a finite resource that must be used efficiently, then streamlining, speeding up systems and making cuts to practices that are deemed wasteful seem like obvious solutions. The ideological processes of marketization and provision rationalization that have dominated health policy over the past 40 years indeed rely on conceptualizations, conceptualizations of time as linear and finite, whereby moving people faster through the system or reallocating time can address the supposed shortfalls. But if we think with waiting, instead of seeking to eradicate it, other possibilities come into view. As Steph and Martin have recently argued, throughout its history, many of those invested in the NHS, patients, staff and others, have waited collectively in the name of what the service could or should be. The long history of activism and demands for change in the NHS cuts across fantasies of a return to a fully resourced and funded service that has never really been experienced as such. Withdrawing from fantasies about the past and the future, they suggest instead that a significant part of preserving what matters about the NHS is being prepared to care on in the present without any clear resolution being visible and in the face of significant losses. This is the kind of caring that also appears in very many moments of everyday care, when nothing much appears to be happening and the future is radically uncertain. But we argue that if we are to be that if we are able to reckon with the essential untimeliness of care that runs alongside even the most timely interventions, and if we're able to learn how care goes from being made fugitive, sorry, if we are able to learn from how care goes on being made fugitively when resources are fundamentally insufficient, it may yet be possible for all those invested in the NHS to see more clearly and indeed more imaginatively, not merely the conditions under which the care and time that people can use go on being made, but the resources required for them to flourish. So I'm gonna hand over to Martin now um, and we'll seamlessly move to him. And uh, yeah, Martin, are you there? <laughs> Hi, yeah, that's me. Um, do, you have a, do you have a slides to share? I have, yes, I've got some hastily put together slides. Hang on a second. Absolutely. Yeah. Laura, you're control of this screen. Is it possible to move the, um, the little bar of faces so they're not just in case Martin is? No, <laughs> maybe not. That, that, that's the best. <laughs> the movie, the mouse. Yeah. That mouse is very unfriendly. Is... Can we? Okay. I think you might have to do it on. Oh, don't worry. It's fine. I was just, it's just if you've got slides that go across to the right in the room, we can't see the very edge, but we'll, 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 we'll okay. We can all shuffle the mouse around for a bit to see if we can. Sorry, I was playing with it earlier to make it work, not to break it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're. Martin. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to set a little timer. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Laura. Um, and hello. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, so uh, this is going to be, I think, probably a slightly Frankenstein's monster type of paper uh, where uh, I, I'm going to spend about five or six minutes. Martin, I think. you're a little bit faint. I don't know whether people online can hear you, but in the room, you're quite quiet. Okay. Uh, it's registering on my mic. That's better. It's better? Okay, yeah. all right. Let me bring that in. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. So I'll spend about five or six minutes trying to give a brief overview of the of the project um, and then spend about 15 or so minutes trying to provide a bit of a case study to, to illuminate some of the themes that, that emerge. Um, so I don't think it'll be especially elegant, but um, that's very on brand. Uh, so, but I hope it'll give a good introduction to, to, to what I've been up to. So uh, hopefully this will change. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
So, okay, so uh, so my research on on waiting times, uh, as Laura's noted, has been into the way that um, that Britain's uh, expansion of welfare provision after the Second World War uh, transformed how time was managed, narrated, and experienced in everyday care provided by British practice. Uh, and crucially, I've been interested in how these transformations remade the lived temporalities and effective relations of care uh, in interdependent yet asymmetric ways for, for doctors, patients and families. Now I've pursued um, these questions through histories of five, uh, what I've called temporal technologies, sites and practices of primary care. Uh, and that's the, uh, the appointment, uh, the waiting room, the consultation, the home visit and uh, anticipatory care. Um, and there are methodical, methodological reasons for why I've made those choices, and I can talk about that slightly longer if anyone's interested in a, in a discussion, um, but the too long didn't read answer for that is that um, uh, they were either novel post-war inventions like the uh, appointment system, uh, or they underwent radical shifts in their organisation and provision during the post-war decades, such as the waiting room and uh, the consultation. And this transformation uh, proved central to the construction of a modern, quote unquote, modern general practice under the NHS, and therefore provoked considerable debate among pra patients, practitioners, policymakers, and cultural commentators across the sort of years that I've been looking at. So we could leverage that discussion basically to reveal uh, long held but often unspoken assumptions uh, about care that developed in general practice um, and for articulating lived experiences of time that would often quickly fade as the novel became routine. So that's a kind of um, the, the long and short of that. Um, so in asking these questions, uh, I've sought to introduce um, uh, the issues of time and care into the histori historiography of the NHS. Um, and I'll hope through the sort of case study that I share um, uh, in a moment um, to show how fundamental issues of time were to the cultural and social life of care uh, in the early NHS. Um, but historians have rarely attended to these issues and where time has appeared, it's often been in relation to political debates over, say, waiting lists or the rights of patient consumers in, um, for instance, visiting hours at hospital. Similarly, the notion of care itself is one that's often regularly invoked um, in relation to health care, but it's rarely given explicit reflection. Uh, and, and finally, I've also sought to challenge, I think, some of the, the academic and popular framings of the period between the 1940s and 1970s. Um, so these decades have often been discussed as uh, the sort of quote unquote classic post uh, welfare state years um, and often romanticized as um, the supposed social social democratic ideal, uh, which was subsequently hollowed out after 1979 through a series of neoliberal reforms. But by focusing on these years um, uh, prior to 1979, in a way, I've sought to use considerations of time and waiting to show the dynamism of the of the, um, the NHS in this classic phase of uh, welfareism, and to draw out the messiness and inequalities of British primary care, even at its most formally universal. And for help um, doing so, I've drawn on a uh, historical literature around welfare and social politics um, that's foregrounded connections with race and racism, uh, the heteronormative, uh, heteronormative gender roles, empire and decolonization, and concepts of the family. And some of those uh, are sort of the texts that I've put on the, uh, on the, on the right, uh, the top line there. Um, but I've also turned to uh, interdisciplinary literatures on time, care, and emotion. So in particular, um, Sarah Sharma's work on temporal architectures of time maintenance, uh, Maria Puig de la Bellacasa's work on care time, and Sarah Ahmed's exploration of the cultural politics of emotion. I will uh, I'll, I'll mention Ahmed's work slightly more in my case study, but Sharma and Bellacasa uh, in particular, the foreground of the ways in which uh, different subjects experience and effective relations of time are interdependent and shaped by social positionality and one's value within a system of capital. So in other words, they help make plain uh, that in discussing temporal relations and experiences of care in the post-war period, we have to attend not just to gen generic categories, um, but how subjects were positioned within historic structures of power and discrimination. Uh, which uh, I realise I'm probably speaking quite quickly, but it does bring me to um, the uh, case study. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I'll delete a couple of slides. Um, which was which is why GPs became so preoccupied with the figure 
of the, um, the repeat or frequent attender between the 1940s and 1960s. Now, over these decades, GPs, um, uh, particularly critical of the NHS, persistently mobilised through professional journals, uh, novels, magazines and news media to lament the mental and emotional toll caused by patients uh, who repeatedly but supposedly needlessly attended for consultation. They often rooted um, these patients' attendance in forms of neurosis and hypochondria, and doctors simultaneously mocked their trivial um, reasons for calling and castigated their abuse of the, um, to quote, the privileges bestowed by the welfare state. Now, in part, uh, I suggest that uh, underpinning GPs' frustrations and hateful projections about repeat attenders uh, were broader professional dissatisfactions with the NHS, uh, and in particular, a perceived loss of temporal autonomy under the new service. Yet, as I also uh, argue, GPs' irritations and political manoeuvrings were shaped by broader post-war cultures of misogyny, uh, racism and class prejudice. And these were intersecting structures of discrimination and othering that were deeply embedded within a predominantly white middle class and male profession. Um, and certain practices of repetition were a defining feature of early NHS general practice, yet the, emo the intense emotional responses of GPs stuck to those subjects whose capacity to call on a doctor most strongly grated against their professional self-image. And through uh, certain racialized, gendered and class constructions of the frequent attender and the, and the general practitioner, there was a, a, an attempt by GPs to consolidate their autonomy within post-war settlements. Uh, and finally, just before um, I begin, I should uh, mention um, and offer a bit of a content warning um, that what there will be examples that I'll draw on that draw on quite strong misogynistic language. Um, and so in discussing that, I don't want to uh, repeat the sort of historical violence or, or trigger lived experiences, um, but I want to situate them as an important part of the NHS's history. They're, if, um, uh, they are emotionally and intellectually difficult to engage with, so please do feel free to, to leave or mute um, if you need to at any time. Uh, okay, so to, uh, to understand why the repeat attender became such a figure of resentment among GPs, uh, I'll provide a bit of historical context because, yay, uh, history. Um, uh, so with the launch of the NHS in 1948, uh, GPs assumed roles as doctor of first contact for a registered list of patients, which averaged around 2,400 patients for a doctor. Uh, patients could attend for any issue they deemed necessary. And GPs consulted, uh, diagnosed and prescribed treatment for those problems they felt could be managed in the community, and they referred to hospital services any of those they felt required specialist attention. There were no direct pay, uh, payments for consultations. Instead, the uh, state paid GPs a fee per patient registered on their list. Uh, and as government documents at, uh, at the time, such as this on the right of the screen um, suggested, all uh, subjects resident in Britain could, could register and use the service uh, with uh, free at the point of use. Uh, now, private practice wasn't banned. Uh, indeed, reflecting their self-perception as a, an independent liberal profession, GPs had mobilised against salaried service um, and for the continuation of private practice when uh, during the 1940s when the um, sort of policy around the NHS was being pursued but very few patients opted to remain uh, private. So, it, and in this way, it marked a, a radical break with pre nhs practice. So there, there had been a system of national health insurance, for primary care since the 1910s. Uh, only a small proportion of GPs had worked exclusively with NHI contracts and, and they were mostly in industrial and working class areas. So most GPs combined a small proportion of national health work with more profitable private practice, um, but the coming of the NHS effectively ended this mixed economy and ended their capacity to control their consulting time through the use of fees. The services universality also incorporated uh, those previously excluded from state funded care, so not just the middle classes, um, but children, married women, and older and unemployed adults. And these were often people that would have had um, uh, worse health than those of sort of working age um, and often required greater time and attention as a result. 
Uh, notably, under the NHS, GPs were made personally responsible for providing continuity of care for patients when it was around the block uh, across illness episodes and over the life course. So, um, on the one hand, uh, G uh, NHS doctors had a 24 hour contract for service. So, any registered patient on their list could attend their advertised surgery hours. And as long as they turned up during those hours, they had a right to be consulted. Um, and doctors were charged with personally attending any patient who uh, was deemed unable to travel at their home. This responsibility extended into the night, as well as across the working week. So GPs could arrange for um, some work and cover for holidays or um, some evening or weekend work, but they had to be within conventions that were policed by fellow doctors. And on the other hand, even when patients had been referred to specialists, GPs remained responsible for the patients of the medical conditions and for their patient's care upon discharge. So basically, other than removing a patient from your list or uh, a patient dying or a doctor dying, um, GP's responsibility for that patient was uh, unending. Um, and this included when a doctor felt an illness episode was resolved or no more can be done, and if the patient kept turning up, then they had a right to be seen. Such arrangements, um, it should be noted, reflected long treasured uh, cultural and political constructions of the family doctor as someone who was an ever available and only competent uh, practitioner. And over the 1950s and 60s, a wide array of uh, commentators had valorized this form of persistent and repetitive contact. And they argued that um, continuity of care distinguished general practice from other forms of medicine. Nonetheless, um, as these sort of news articles I've placed on the right suggest, um, Despite certain forms of recurrent contact being central to the ideological promise of uh, NHS general practice, GPs and their professional organisations complained consistently about their working conditions uh, almost immediately um, from 1948. Um, so popular subjects included uh, poor pay, growing income gaps to specialists, the costs of practice improvements, and the, uh, the tolls of always untimely night work. However, um, especially grating to GPs, was how a supposed uh, absence of fees had brought, or, or how an absence of fees had supposedly brought ever more demanding patients to their door with trivial problems. As one GP uh, note, noted in 1949, our surgeries are overcrowded, uh, but not with people who are ill. And the swamping of surgeries by people with the most trivial conditions is stultifying medicine, so that one does not have the time nor mental alertness to deal with those who are really ill. Uh, and this swamping they suggested uh, uh, prevented the offer of timely cares to those who were genuinely uh, in need in inverted commas. Um, they had to, these patients had to wait in the surgery also for a long time. And then when they were seen by the doctor, that attention was often squeezed. Um, so the doctors claimed. Now, whilst the conditions of uh, NHS service were undoubtedly um, straining, uh, I think complaints like these gesture to how GPs' frustrations were rooted in more fundamental status anxieties. Uh, in particular, the temporal promises of universal healthcare challenged long-held values uh, and practices of temporal autonomy that had sat at the core of GPs' professional self-image. And that these anxieties and values were rooted in racialized and class masculinities, I think was clear from doctors' regular recourse to languages of servitude and enslavement. Um, so uh, taking this, this, this top excerpt here, um, patients now have argued one BMA leader in 1950, the unqualified right to ring up at any hour of the day or night and demand the doctor's presence. Did we bargain that the terms of service were to include being general errand boys for every neurotic in the country? And uh, this uh, excerpt on the bottom um, suggests that doctors at one BMA meeting in 1956 went even further. And here they complained about, to quote, uh, being virtually unprotected against a small but obdurate minority of their patients who regarded the general practitioner as the nearest the welfare state can get to a slave. Now, um, following um, Sarah Ahmed, then we can see how such uh, effectively charged outbursts were both deeply felt and discursive political interventions. They were integral to political projects for enhancing uh, professional power within post-war welfare, and then attempted to enroll GPs within collective action. The rooting of these appeals uh, within intersecting structures of um, racialized and classed forms of othering should perhaps be unsurprising. So I've already noted in, in the introduction that post-war welfare projects have been built around um, 
uh, imperial uh, investments in the white heteronormative family. But as Douglas Haynes and, uh, and others have shown, uh, racism, sexism and class prejudice have been core features of British uh, medical professionalism since the 19th century. Uh, indeed, even as general practice itself became increasingly reliant on uh, racialized migrant and women doctors, white male dominance of the field and its professional norms was maintained in various ways. Now, these forms of, uh, of othering and discrimination were integral to the construction of and frustrations with frequent attendance. Uh, the effective counterpart uh, to the degraded GP, uh, the symbolic marker and literal cause of their debasement, if you will, uh, was the unrestrained frequent attender. The two figures were inextricably linked and had become opposite sides of the same uh, project for uh, white professional autonomy. Now, of course, some um, patients did consult more than others, uh, but as one oral history interviewee, um, which is an interviewee uh, taken in a, in a project conducted in the early 1990s, suggested, uh, reflecting on their, uh, their mid-century practice, uh, GPs conceptually and emotionally divided frequent attenders into, to quote unquote, deserving and undeserving patients. So the former suffered uh, legitimate chronic illnesses in need of regular follow-up, and the latter were essentially hypochondriacal. These were subjects who uh, lacked uh, capacity for masculine forbearance or independence from external authority, and therefore coded uh, like racialized colonial subjects. Or alternatively, they, they failed the white bourgeois standards for maternal social reproduction at the heart of post-war welfare. So their uncontrolled calls left the doctor, um, to quote the, the bottom lines here, uh, beating your head against the brick wall because you knew they'd always come back. Uh, notably, uh, uh, two figures recurred within the discursive and effective uh, landscape of, of, of GP's complaints about um, re uh, repeat attenders, and through this they seeped into uh, public discourse. The first was, uh, to quote uh, the, the article at the top, the moaning neurotic always attending for more physical treatment for his tortured mental condition. The second, to quote, was the overanxious mother calling in the doctor for every trivial and often imaginary childish complaint. And crucially, these two figures were often joined intergenerationally. Uh, it is noted uh, one article in the popular um, magazine Family Doctor, to quote, the mother's job to act as guardian of the family health, not only for their immediate protection, but so they shall uh, grow up able to take care of their own health. Those who failed and, quote, fussed over their children produced hypochondriacs like uh, Mr. Black, a, uh, to quote, middle-aged businessman who at the, the slightest palpitation goes to bed, sends for the doctor and insists on a complete overhaul. In the present, moreover, um, this form of uh, clucking motherhood, uh, which was labelled a variant of emotionally insecure dependence, wastes our time by too frequent calls for unnecessary reasons. Uh, now, there were um, other framings for this figure. So um, uh, Stephen uh, Taylor mobilized a kind of eugenic critique almost of what he called a, a small, truly sickness prone group to quote a stage army who reappear over and over again and who seem to be made to quote of poor stuff, both mental and physical. But Taylor was, um, was unusual in essentially making it the GP's responsibility for managing their responses. Um, so uh, he suggested that thinking of these patients as to quote weaker brethren helps keep in check the irritation which is all too easily aroused by their endless complaints. Oh, uh, and he wasn't the uh, uh, the only uh, doctor uh, practitioner to suggest this. Um, so marking the diversity of visions for care emerging in response to universal healthcare. Um, innovative practitioners in general practice psychotherapy suggested that it was in fact the GP who, who drove um, patients to run over through the inability to listen to their patients' needs. So they basically suggested that what was required was to stop an automatic response to repeat attenders um, with a kind of a clinical exam um, and, to off, and to sort of match a, a return to the surgery with a chronic attendance to, uh, to the patient. And in essence, even to wait until the patient was ready to explore what's really underpinning um, their, uh, their return. However, um, most GPs ultimately uh, pushed a, a strategy of suggesting for fees or fines for patients or code of conduct. Um, 
uh, to sort of curtail their, their constant bothering. Now, though these projects were not realized, uh, collective professional action did secure GPs um, significant changes in the regulations in the mid 1960s, and they were enabled uh, to basically defer any patient attending that they felt did not require uh, immediate um, attendance, which sort of marked a particular shift in patients' right to timely consultations as was set out in the 1940s. So these forms of, of racialized, sexist, and classed um, uh, tropes formed a constitutive part of this campaign um, to sort of consolidate professional autonomy within post-war welfare, and they solidified cultural tropes of the unrestrained male neurotic, over-anxious mother, and hysterical middle-aged and elderly housewife within a, a, a popular and political discourse. Now, these legacies can be uh, legacies of these complaints can be seen today. So I think we still see um, fines. Uh, and fees, for instance, proposed as policies to regulate claims on collectivized medical time. And equally, as um, Stephanie Davies and Michael Flex's work on the projects make clear, uh, the frequent attendant lives on in the psychological world of primary care. Their resistance to curative trajectories continuing to provoke a mix of anger, self-doubt and despair for primary care doctors. So perhaps speaking to enduring professional projects, these patients continue to represent not just a limit of general practices open door, but also its complex relationship with temporalities of repetition, uh, waiting and continuity. So finish there. Thank you. I was expecting you to be And um, um, could, could, could we get the, the strip, Michael, have you got the in charge of the... Um, well, the I, I can't get anyone back. Um, it might not matter because this is this is the perfect time to start. Thank you. Um, we will now take a five minute break before we have Michael's presentation. So I don't know whether we can uh, mute. Can we mute this room? I don't, have you got the power to do that? On, on my computer. I'm not even, yeah, on, I'm not even running, running this. Computer, okay. But can I say before, before the people go, if people wanted to look um, at well, if they've got the break and they're in front of the computer not going anywhere, they could look at what are you waiting for.org.uk and see some of the stories I'm going to be talking about immediately after the break. You could say that, but we do, we are meant to have a complete break <laughs> so that people can rest their eyes and sure, but if someone but has... if someone doesn't need to rest their eyes, they could look at what was it? D they wanted to feed their eyes. If they want feast to feast their eyes. Yeah. What was it again? What are you waiting for? .org.uk. What are you waiting for? .org.uk. We will reconvene at um, four o'clock. Thank you.
Let me um, start my video. Oh, oh. Now, do you want me to try and do that trick of making this disappear? Um, welcome back, everyone. We've got one more presentation uh, from Michael Flexer, then we should have um, 10 minutes or so for um, Q&A. In fact, even more if your thousand words doesn't take that. So welcome back. Uh, Michael, take it away. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and, and to explain, as you can see on the on the opening slide, it says uh, uh, also Kalechi and Uche, because a, a large portion of the work that I'm going to talk about was um, was intellectually and, pra and practically a collaboration with, with Kalechi as well. He's, he's not here presenting at the moment. Um, uh, just to lay out some of the publicly engaged research we did or intended to do on the uh, on the waiting times project. Where we were, um, so we started, and this is the work that uh, Kalecha and I did together on a collaboration with hospice care charity in uh, Devon, working with a day hospice in a in the market town of Honiton, um, doing uh, well. What eventually became a kind of storytelling collaborative. Um, set of workshops. Uh, we then had a, 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 a piece of work with uh, what was at the time, and I should point out that nearly all of the organisations whose logos are on display here, during the period of their engagement with us, vanished as organisations, um, which is a, a, a strange coincidence and um, wasn't, our, wasn't our operating practice. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Laura alluded to the fact that the uh, the kind of process of public engagement became an object of study as well, and that was particularly um, driven by by the work that you can see there with the um, uh, the proposed work with respiratory outpatient clinics in Bristol and Life of Breath project, which um, I received these letters from the HRA. Um, and uh, NHS Ethics on the 27th of March 2020, telling me I absolutely could go into uh, outpatient respiratory clinics and do work with people in their waiting rooms, um, which I, do, I include this not just as give an example of the kind of madness of bureaucratic machines spewing out letters, but also a kind of a temporal world and a, a time stream that never never came to be, but that these letters kind of belong in this parallel universe. Um, uh, this is an example of some of the work that we did do at uh, the uh, hospice care in Devon. This is where I'm going to start uh, with this, uh, with, a, with, with my analysis. So uh, this is a quote from one of the participants, um, one, of the, uh, one of our collaborators rather. Uh, the time on dialysis is dead time. The time can be quite heavy. I realised early on, if I was to allow myself to get bored, I wouldn't in fact last very long. Making the time productive was a key part of the therapy. The poems are the current product of that. So elsewhere, um, Kalechi and I have written about our experience of co-designing a storytelling intervention in a day hospice, um, working collaboratively with the staff, professional carers, unwaged carers, service users, and their families. As expressed by Colin, who you just heard from, um, an enthusiastic participant collaborator, for many in this particular group we were working with, time presents initially as a problem, a heavy deadening weight, a present absence, a tangible quantum of loss. Simultaneously, for those with terminal diagnoses or progressive illnesses, there was both too little time and too much. When days are numbers, numbered, they exhibit both finitude and a yawning, open emptiness. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the website. Yeah. I invite you guys to see. Um, so poor health pushes us into these temporal economies of scarcity. The dwindling quality-adjusted life years of the therapeutic pathway, the swinging apportioning of clinical time by health bureaucracies, the desperate auctioneering of the end of life. When placed within such an economy, Strategies of resistance are often themselves delineated and delimited by the terms and spectrum of possibilities of that which they resist. So denial and deferral reiterate and reify the very temporal rationing they're pushing against. I want to read this quotation from Brenda. Um, these are pseudonymized um, uh, quotations. Uh, to me, going through my path at the moment, I feel that, okay, I know what the doctors have said, 
I've got it until day dot, but in my head, day dot is not existing. As far as I'm concerned, I'm here, as I've told my doctor, he's got me for the long haul and I mean it. I do. So you've got to put up with me for a long time. Stories offer a black market alternative to the formal economy, of medicine and mortality. Within stories are smuggled contraband temporalities. Against the strict linear pull of the life course, they offer up a vertical flight of escape. In the stories we told together whilst waiting, past times, future times, alternative presents were exploded out and upwards. This transportation and displacement through aesthetic contemplation or creation can offer some simple curatives or relief. A palliative detachment akin to Billy Pilgrim's Tralfamadorian serenity in Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, whereby we can let go of present worries, future threats, and past traumas to sign, so it goes. We can see this here in Joan's contemplation of the affect hearing Don McLean's uh, Vincent has on her. Suddenly it just came on and I thought, oh, and that's what started it all off. The minute I hear it, I just go back to when I was 32 and I remember that. I basically live through it again and I love listening to it when I feel a bit yuck. So I should explain one of the, one of the storytelling methodologies that developed with hospice care and that we then took on to other, other strands of the work was to uh, invite people to bring in a piece of music that transported them to a different moment in their life either transporting them, maybe transporting them to a moment of waiting or taking them out of a moment of waiting. And then play the song to the, to the group and maybe preface it or, or describe afterwards why it was important or, um, you know, and sometimes a bit of discussion. And we would edit these into audio where the song and the discussion are, are sort of combined in a, in a type of, type of trans-temporal artifact. Um, but, um, yeah, and some of those are available already on the site and more will be available soon, sort of split across the two uh, uh, waiting time sites at the moment. Um, yet stories do not operate as a blind rejection of the present. The present moment in its rich, diectic relatedness is reinvigorated. The temporal transcendence remains anchored to that point in time that is the telling, the reading, or the reception, as Bar famously observed, a text unity lies not in its origin, but its destination. Sometimes this act of enunciation offers up an unproblematic instance for its own telling, its own becoming. As the voice of the storyteller magics up, formalizes and unifies the circle of listeners. When one group at the hospice started speaking of starling murmurations, this organizational metaphor rebounded back onto the assemblage of listeners and tellers. Dialectically, the spoken of and the speakers co-constructed, communicating themselves into a heterogeneous community. Other groups discovered other organizational metaphors, tales of bombed out cities and towns from their wartime childhoods, of telegram messengers and airmail blueies, of dance halls and coffee shops. And through these, they were reconstituted reconstituted themselves in the present as well. It's a nice quotation here from one of the participants. And the waiting is over, but your condition remains the same. You wish you hadn't waited so bloody long, you know, to be told what I think we sometimes already know. Um, sometimes these temporalities clashed with meanings impossible or too painful to articulate openly, too openly. One participant only a few weeks from death spoke of his regret about not visiting his father when he was dying decades earlier and of his own daughter's reluctance to return from abroad to see him at this moment in time. In a story re reassuring himself that his father knew he loved him, the storyteller slipped into the present tense. He knows, yes, but still very difficult. As perhaps a telegram to his own daughter, acknowledging the difficult situation she faces in that moment. So the ability of stories to make their own time, both in their alternative substitutive verticality, a kind of paradigmatic metaphorical slip into another time stream, and in their reinvigoration and lightening of their moment of enunciation, positions the telling and receiving of stories as a potent means of reclaiming the lost energies, agencies, and potentiality swallowed up in waiting. When we wait, 
a future protensively extends onto us. When we tell stories, a present security extensively affirms us. A network of relations is ushered up, and within that network are the temporal exchanges required for its own self-realization. So stories contain the time of which they tell and the time of their own telling. The object time of the rationing economies of health bureaucracies, where time is a scarce quantity, can therefore give way to an intersubjective time of relations of attendance, where time is a quality that cannot be numerated or regulated. From a substance that can be bought and sold in exchanges to a flow that cannot be dammed. So aside from all the other planes on which it is obviously a crisis, homeostat homeostatic, experiential, emotional, the end of life is also a crisis of diexis, those relations of um, being co-present in a, in, a, in a shared space and time. And therefore, dietic relations themselves, as reinstituted through agentive, mutual, participatory exchanges such as story sharing, have, I'm putting scare quotes here, curative potential. An answer, as we discovered as we embarked on virtual story telling, sorry, an answer as we discovered as we embarked on virtual storytelling sessions in the eye of the pandemic, to a crisis that shatters embodied relations, social networks, and their constitutive temporalities, is to attend to each other through the mutually recognizing and reaffirming telling of stories. Um, as one storyteller mused, wonder what they're going to write about 2020. It didn't really exist, did it? Unreal, heavy and dead time of waiting never really existed, but each supercharged instance of creative enunciation, each story is an energetic, defiant, renegade cry of presence, of reality and of substantiated events in the face of this temporal dilution. That's what <laughs> Well, you're unaware. I've had people very unaware. So I was just writing yeah. something down and thinking there was an inclusion. Yeah, so this is the website, what are you waiting for? .uk. The stories I've referred to are either there or, or, or will be there. Um, uh, you can visit it by, well, you guys can't click on this actually because I'm just, I'm just sharing the screen, but you can go there and, uh, and see it. And I'll, I'll stop, stop screen share. Oh, and then we've, we're back. Fantastic, thank you. I'm going to open that up. I've got loads of questions, but I'm not going to abuse. Um, are there any, if people want to put it in the chat um, or wave their hand, I, I may see. I think Katrina's got her hand up. I think she's just clapping. Oh, she's clapping. <laughs> Sorry, Katrina. <laughs> but that's. I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. That was just the most wonderful, fabulous presentation. And I'm just, just reflecting and I'm sure I will have lots of questions, but I just wanted to let you know how brilliant it was. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so excited to see what the, um, so just, you know, wave, wave a, an emoticon or whatever it is and I'll, I'll notice it. Can I, um, can I leap in then and abuse my privilege um, while other people are gathering their thoughts? And it was just something, I, I, I think Martin had, um, had used that idea of the, of, of the GP's loss of temporal autonomy as, as a kind of as a hook for kind of trying to think why this figure of the frequent attender was quite so troubling to them in the early NHS days. But I, I just wanted to ask all of you actually about that kind of idea of, I don't, I don't know whether it's autonomy or control or something about waiting and time and the, 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 the kind of the, the, the affect of it being different when it when it's kind of imposed by by who it's been imposed by or how much control of you of, of what you've got and whether there, there is anything from either the the um the end of life care people or from 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 the literary sources on on yeah on autonomy and control and what that does to the affect of waiting i mean it, it came uh it came up again and again and again and again in the stories, more so, not so much the end of life stories, but the stories during the pandemic where we did online storytelling of people broadly. So I don't, I don't think I, um, I mean, I know there's a historical reference that Martin's making to particularly the kind of GPs being pulled onto, you know, um, home visits and on call uh, in, in the 40s through 50s, but the kind of counter, the sort of counter-revolution um, in that kind of 
uh, temporal um, uh, uh, power struggle is that you know there's no there's no end to waiting um, on the on the plane of kind of like medical exchange for people with a kind of chronic condition or even the sense that they might be waiting to find out what a chronic condition that they may or may not have is uh, and there's no structure in whereby the doc, whereby the kind of clinician can wait there's no there's no waiting being done at the other end there's no attending on in that in that way because as soon as the clinician is there and you're kind of ushered into the space or kind of filtered through to the point or, or received by them then that's a pure action and then and then and then you're gone <laughs> um you know you know you know, um and and that was the thing that bothered uh more than bothered uh like i think kind of mm -hmm. like de like deranged and upset people in the in the pandemic much maybe much more so than the, their experience of ill health was yeah you know, and, and we can think about like things about the um it created a lot of gaming as well really mm -hmm. uh so things with trying to get your gp appointment and knowing the time to call yeah people frankly talking about how they would have to sham or uh, sham emotional upset, um, or, or inc increase the amount of emotional upset they felt in order to kind of get through that, to not be taken off of a kind of, you know, a kind of waiting, or waiting to wait, because that's yeah. those so soft structures of waiting, waiting to, wait. to wait. Yeah, yeah, where you have to call back 24 hours later to see if you can then get an appointment, or wait a while to then see if you can get an appointment. Sorry, yeah, so, yeah, no, so that's I think it's a really <clears throat> sort of broad level, um that one of the, you're quite right to say one of the things that makes waiting feel on intolerable is the lack of autonomy in relation to it but interestingly one of the things that seems to make waiting feel more tolerable is the potent is the idea that you that someone might be waiting alongside you mm -hmm. um and that mm -hmm. interestingly is the acknowledgement of a, a kind of dependence so you on the one hand there's a desire not to wait, not to be autonomous. And on the other hand, in these conditions where care is being asked for, it's the capacity to be open to that dependence that seems to produce the possibility of managing something. Yeah, that's that's kind of it. yeah, it's interesting. I, there was a um, it's just reminded me a kind of this is a sort of footnote really. But we interviewed a lot of people about welfare benefits a few years ago, and one of the interesting thing a lot of older adults said about um, not using private medicine was this thing about I think it's right to wait, and yeah. and, and there's a kind of there's almost um, a kind of moral the moral economy yeah. of, of waiting. Is part of what, my, and that's the thing about that kind of the, co the collectivity of it. Yeah, and was not kind jumping of, the queue. Not jumping the queue, yeah. but also just it was the waiting that had the the, the kind of weight of that's what you ought to do. Yeah, you know, really, if I mean, people are prepared to wait but, um, but as long as it's a collective. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but if you think someone else is jumping the queue, yeah. in, or you've been forgotten and you're not actually in the queue at all, that's incredible. That's, that is in <laughs> Alex. You have your hand up, I think. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Um, hi, that was um, so fascinating listening to all those talks. Um, and I hope that my brain will function enough to form a question. Um, I was just particularly thinking about your talk, Martin, it really resonated with, um, you know, years ago, I did my uh, PhD study in A&E and there was so much about, I mean, they weren't called maybe neurotics, but things like acopias, socials or or even just crap um, about the kind of the, the patients that aren't the sort of legitimate and, and often around maintaining a sense of boundaries around professional identities. Um, so it was quite interesting that I think those those tropes and discourses are still very much there, but that are also very much around that kind of moralizing um, and disciplining. So I suppose that was sort of the question I had in my mind as to whether because certainly for what I saw in Haley that that waiting was in some instances and in some occasions used as a form of discipline um and people felt that in their own experience of waiting that it felt like that they were being and i mean disciplined in the sense that they were being taught about future behaviors you know what's what's what is a legitimate call to resources of time of medical intervention so they can kind of practice that going forward as well as just 
being made to wait in that instance. I was wondering if that was something that came out in, in any of the projects really about the idea of the kind of moral responsibilities, but also that sort of disciplining of waiting. Um, Do we not back to Martin first? Please. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> not, not uh, explicitly um, in that sense within general practice in the period I was looking at, I think specifically because um, one, the, it was much smaller scale than A&E, these practices that I was looking at, of gem, you know, they're generally kind of one, two doctors, maybe, and and the sort of, the, 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 at least the narrative around the weight there was this, as going back to what Judy and Laura were talking about in terms of the not jumping the queue, the kind of, you know, you, you, you waited in turn. But the doctors were also not shy about not necessarily using waiting as disciplining, but just explicitly saying, why have you got why have you come to me with this or alternatively why did you wait so long to bother me and and this is the kind of you know part of the thing that I tried to pull out in some of the uh, the work in in the book is the way that patients get kind of trapped buffeted between these conflicting discourses of you know minor things might be really important you need to come early and then if you don't you kind of get berated for you know why haven't you come sooner and these sort of notions about, well, actually, you know, you cut, people are coming for every minor thing that doesn't need to be seen. Most of the time, you just need to wait and see whether it persists. And 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 the sort of the, the irony for me is that in Bevan kind of talks about the NHS as, and, and part of the welfare state as being in place of fear. And actually kind of what gets inculcated is a sense of anxiety and uncertainty for a lot of patients about when it is appropriate to, to bother the, the doctor. Um, yeah. but, but certainly I did see in some of the kind of sociological literature in the 70s and 80s, a similar thing in A&E actually about reference to, to particularly, I think it was um, people who were attending with alcohol related issues or, or because they're basically considered to be homeless as being trash. And therefore they could be, they'd be triaged in a way where they'd be left to last in order, yeah. you know, and, 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 and sort of pulled, pulled through in that way. Um, I think that might speak to a slight difference in this sort of historical position in general practice then. I yeah. suspect that um, further on, as appointment systems get established, that there's probably kind of informal triaging going on by reception staff and by doctors themselves in terms of who is going to get prioritised for these things. And that's where the waiting gets shifted from inside the surgery to outside the surgery. And that's one of the sort of historical transitions that you know is that even when people were inside the practice surgery there was still a sense of being held in a way that there was you still yeah. see people discuss that oh, we're waiting so long because our doctor's so thorough and it's annoying but I know that when it comes my turn I'll get the same attention when as when it takes place outside of the surgery and it's much in, in often much more atomized there's a kind of much more frustration I think attached to that waiting often because it goes on rather than hours it's it's for sort of days or up to weeks so that's yeah a yeah. bit of a memorable, but um I'll, I'll yeah, no, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Just just to um, I suppose jump in on um thinking about some of the work that Jordan's been doing at, at JIDS. I think lots of the service users at JIDS feel that both the waiting for even to be seen at all is an expression of a kind of violence, a social violence against the position of of being a trans person, um, especially as it's played out over the last few years as a real culture war issue. But even within the service, once you get seen, the idea of, well, what we're offering is thinking time. For lots of people, that feels like it comes too late and it's another, and it's, mm -hmm. I, I had someone once describe it as it feels like it's a cruel and unusual punishment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and then of course, there are people on, on another side of the debate who, who see that you, the way in which time, you know, for exam, example, the sort of suggestion that suicidality might be increased um, if people are asked to wait as a kind of blackmailing. Um, so, yeah, it, I think it, it links. It, it, uh, yeah, those kind of disciplining and just get folded in in, in complex ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's before we go into the reception staff who often get yes. the <laughs> sort of imposing the waiting even when um so I, I won't go too much as I know Christian wants to <laughs> Chris, yeah. Chris do, you, do you want to come in 
Yes, yes, just briefly. This is related to some, some work we're putting together uh, with actually with Martin about uh, another and other people, Haley also, about kind of the complex this, this distinction between formal and informal mental health care workers. And it, we've been kind of struggling with that distinction because we know it exists, but at the same time, it's hard to put a name on it or kind of define it. And I was thinking that maybe temporality is one aspect of that, in the sense of community workers being more attuned to the temporalities of people and without this requirement of having more control and autonomy over how available they are in a way. Mm -hmm. Because this is following Martin, that this is also, I think, very interesting. Like it, it was a, a matter of, of availability and the, what we call in Chile, the poly consultant, the guy that comes over and over, kind of uh, violates the rules of your availability. Um, and I was thinking that maybe this temporality could be an axis to understand the, 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 the caregiver that is more proximate to, to people's lives in a way. But this is just a thought, uh, and maybe Martin have some thoughts, I don't know. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Martin, did you want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess only in so far as to sort of speak to the to the paper in the, um, in the sort of, you know, in, and that's one thing that general practitioners are trying to sort of push against collectively is, to, is against this sort of notion that they are ever available. And that partly the sort of one of the changes that I'm tracing and one of the reasons that I think that post-war period is interesting is an emergence of, if you like, an organizational regime of time in relation to care, um, which which might often get kind of, you know, projected in terms of a sort of a neoliberal agenda because it's about kind of also enrolled in things like efficiency and productivity but actually kind of has its roots I think much earlier and a sort of you know about that kind of boundary setting and, and I wonder if we would sort of think about as you say those those informal healthcare workers and the sort of settings they're working in that the sort of capacity and even desire to maybe institute that kind of organizational regime as a buffer is potentially not present um so that's the kind of best it's the best i can do now but i think I'll, I'll i'll dwell on that chris and i think we can take that forward yeah that's root and branch martin isn't it that how all in like all institutions when they're talking about a certain a certain vein of efficiency involves basically transplanting temporal cost onto people whose time they're not accountable for mm -hmm. um yeah it seems across the nhs and it's just particularly good at that. And university centre. And university. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but also just as a, as a kind of performative way of marking out status or or, or, or dominance or anything else. It's kind of making making it absolutely clear that, that the time of one actor in a system is, is more valuable or more controllable than, than, than that of a, a client or mm. another actor in the system. It's, it's often quite performative, isn't it, in a way? It's a good way of to link that to I sort of making people believe, accept their status as trash, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. A sort of person in a, a GP practice that we were sitting observing who had somehow was fallen out of the system for being registered there, for, for having attended. So they were there, they'd been sitting there all day when I'd been sitting there. And at the end of the day, when they were cleaning up, they were left there and they were saying, I've been here all day. And the person receptionist said, you didn't attend. You weren't here. Yeah. You, you, and they said, look, it says you're not here. It was, there, it was, there, yeah, there, you it was were, amazing. Yeah, and it was just as the clearing up at the end, they were like, they were like trash. I, I, I think Chris, that, sorry, I, I was just going to say, Chris, I would really encourage you to be in contact with Reluca Soriano, who's now at Essex, who was on the project and this work on psychoanalytic free clinics across the world. Mm -hmm. It's this question of when, of when the fee isn't there what what gets exchanged between people and how how is people how how does people's time both <laughs> the patient and the uh and the analyst in that um in that framework how does that start to get used in particular way, way? so there may be some interesting links i think absolutely yeah thank you yeah and, and i think it also just to go back to what you were saying, uh, Michael Judy, about kind of transposing the sort of costs of, of waiting, but also those kind of hierarchies and 
um, sort of manifestations of power get sort of played out in general practice in terms of who gets to be off duty, um, free of either waiting or action, and you know the, the emergence of um, deputising services to cover night work is all built on migrant and racialized minoritized labor. Um, and, and so th th those doctors are constantly on <laughs> overnight because the, you know quite often these white, white male doctors don't want to do the night work. So there's a kind of uh, an economy that develops within the welfare state in the 50s and 60s that sort of plays out again on those sort of racialized hierarchies um, of, you know, of, of value and time. Because it's it's almost that there was a recent debate in British primary care about that responsibility for the on call and the the, the, the the professional GP still in some senses had to be constantly available. But, but there was some sense that there was an erosion of what it meant to be a British primary care specialist if, if you were if you were in these very very large clinics and everything was farmed out and you'd kind of lost that element of continuity and. So there's something about the ways that there's nothing inevitable about the way that the waiting and the time is parceled out, but it, it gets it gets kind of tied to particular aspects of professional identity in relation to other professionalizing projects and relation to to kind of other ways of manage. I mean, there's nothing inevitable about it. That's all I mean. Uh, if that makes sense. It's really interesting. Just a couple of weeks ago, we presented to the some JIDS clinicians at the at the Tavistock and the. I mean, they have been going through a very, very difficult time recently. And but it, interestingly, they were experiencing it as particularly painful that that very, a, a number of very painful things, but that very day, they've been told that they, they were no longer to be allowed to be responsible for their own waiting list and that it had been sort of farmed out to yeah, another yeah, yeah. service. And this was experienced as a kind of professional humiliation. You know, you're not even capable of looking after managing. your own list. The waiting is yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm. We, we are um, out of time. Are there any other kind of final, very quick things, or any final comments from the speakers that they want to throw in? If not, Michael's given you the website with stories on it, which you, people can add their own yeah. stories of waiting oh. to. It's a, it's a oh. living archive. And we all wait. have stories of waiting. Oh, we do. <laughs> yes. We certainly do. So please um, do add them. Yeah. And we'll thank the speakers again. Thank you. That was just fantastic. And I'm sure everyone else is. And um, that is clapping, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, all. Thank you very much, Charlotte, uh, Lucy, for, yes, for the management. And is it Marae for the, the transcribing? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.